Hi everyone, this is Jackson Steger and you're listening to Campfire, a new limited series podcast from Cabin. Campfire is a show translating the jargon of DAOs into plain English to help listeners understand how decentralized autonomous organizations achieve wildly ambitious and creative goals. Each week, we are joined by different DAO leaders and operators who share the tips, tricks, and tactics that they have used to build community and ship product. Campfire is produced by Cabin, which is a DAO building a decentralized city for independent online creators. Today's guests are John and Zach, the founders of Creator Cabins, also known as Cabin DAO or just Cabin. John's official title in our Discord is Caretaker, and Zach's is Facilitator of the Guilds. He also leads product. This season will focus on a bunch of different DAOs, but since this podcast is produced by Cabin, we're going to bookend the season with Cabin episodes. Today we'll be very vision oriented. We chat about Cabin's mission, its historical context, and our goals for the next few months. When we revisit Cabin 11 episodes from now, we'll do more of a retrospective and get nitty gritty with the details. You can find out more about Cabin by going to creatorcabins.com or checking us out on Twitter at Creator Cabins. All right. Here's the episode. Let's get it. Welcome, John. Welcome, Zach. We're coming at you live from the cabins outside of Austin, Texas. Super excited to be here. We've been doing a ambassador residency program all week, and this morning we kicked things off with this fun dance movement. So I'm all energized. How are you guys feeling? Feeling great. Yeah, so stoked. It's a beautiful day outside. I went on a long walk earlier. I loved watching you guys dance. <laughs> feeling awesome. very stoked. So I want to talk today about all things Cabin. Cabin is producing this podcast. This is Campfire by Cabin. There's plenty of both camp metaphors and city metaphors that we use throughout our community and throughout our project vision. John, I want to start very simple. What is Cabin? Yeah, Cabin is a decentralized city for independent online creators. And what we mean by that is that the past century or two, we've had cities that got built around the dominant technology of the era, which for the most part in in the last century was cars. And we believe that in the next century, cities are going to be built around the new dominant technology of the era, which is the internet. We believe that there are going to be a whole lot more people living the independent online creator lifestyle that we've been living and that they're going to start wanting to meet their internet friends online, but then get together in person. And we are building a a set of nodes where we'll have a shared culture and governance across a network of different locations for people to come hang out with their internet friends IRL. And so this idea of a node, I, I think as I've talked to people like my mom about Cabin, it's been helpful to emphasize that the node is a, is a physical place. Like we are here on 28 acres of land uh, outside Austin, Texas. So using neighborhoods as a metaphor, could you elaborate a little bit more on what a node is and how it fits into that city vision? Yeah, we use the word node partially because I think it helps people think about a, a network and, and sort of different points of gathering in that network. But neighborhood might actually be a better term for us to use. I think you could think of each of the places in the network as a a different neighborhood. And the only difference is that unlike a normal city where those neighborhoods are right next to each other, you know, our neighborhoods will hopefully be spread out all over the world. Awesome. Uh, Zach, I I will get to you in a second, but first there is a, a very particular article that John, you wrote called a brief history of decentralized cities and centralized states. And in that article, you highlighted this pattern of bundling and unbundling that has happened over and over through human history. So for our audience, could you identify at a high level what that pattern has been? Sure. So the basic pattern is that you start out with this some sort of new technology for coordination and communication. And this new coordination technology ends up allowing people to form these effective local decentralized governance structures, usually around cities. And then those tend to turn into federated networks of of sort of decentralized cities, um, and, and then ultimately end up being overtaken by a centralized sovereign structure that then sort of grows too big and collapses under its own weight. 
And so when we started working on the decentralized city that, that is Cabin, we weren't really thinking deeply about the historical precedents here, but it turned out as you know we dug in, and if you look at the sort of major periods of human history, which are usually identified as you know, the ancient history period, Sumerians, Egyptians, uh, et cetera, the classical period of Greek city-states and the Roman Empire, the medieval period of knights and kings and castles and churches, and then the modern period of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment industrialization. Each one of those phases actually follows that kind of storyline of, of decentralization and centralization. Sure. So yeah, for the benefit of the listener, can you pick one of those eras and choose just how that new tech leads to the new decentralized governance structure, leads to the new centralized, more efficient structure that then collapses under its own weight, your choice? Sure. And yeah, I mean, it's hard to pick just one. Uh, I, I love all of them and I, I think they all have great examples. You know, I think the original DAO, so to speak, was, was the irrigation systems of the dank river valleys that ultimately turned into the Egyptian empire. But may, maybe the clearest example of decentralized cities comes from Greek city-states and the Roman empire. So ba- basically what happened is there was this group of people called the Phoenicians who figured out that you could take hieroglyphs and turn them into a phonetic alphabet and have these interchangeable letters. And then they got on ships and started, you know, sailing around the sea and handing out this alphabet to people. And it turned out it was this amazing coordination technology that allowed people to, particularly the early Greek city-states, to start forming and to start, you know, not only writing epic poetry and and playing the Olympic Games and sort of coordinating on a, a bigger scale than than had been seen since the collapse of the Egyptian Empire. And then, you know, ultimately these groups of people realized that they could also use this phonetic alphabet to start having much stronger written records around government structures. And so probably with the caveat, of course, that that there were a whole lot of slaves and like other kind of fundamental um, problems with their conception of democracy, Mm -hmm. the Greek city-states ended up being the first place where these local democratic structures really, really formed in in cities. And then they, the cool thing I I didn't realize until I started researching this is that those city-states rather than trying to grow really big, what they did is when they got up to you know a size where they, they felt like it was getting too big for a group of people to easily self-govern, they would spin off a new city state and you know have a portion of the community go start their own independent mm-hmm. place a little while away from, from the current city. And you got this proliferation of all these independent Greek city states that were sort of loosely federated. Then the Romans, who had been trying to do the same thing, ended up getting basically Julius Caesar turned it from the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire and then sacked Greece. And there was like this crazy 200 year period of universal basic income in the form of free bread and bathhouses and, you know, these like large blood sport carnivals where they were murdering a lot of people, which was was not great. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, that's sort of like late stage centralized empire type vibes. You, you can't keep doing that forever. Eventually you... Uh, you reach the limits of, of that type of system and, and it collapses. And then, you know, that's how we ended up in the dark age. So, you know, again, you can see that same structure play out across each of these major periods of human history. So thinking now in the modern era, we see like we're, we're here in the U.S. where like our large once federated, now relatively centralized national structure seems to be coming on to, under all of these other pressures what is it about the network state that presents an opportunity for a new way for us to coordinate humans at scale? Yeah, it's a great question. So if you look at kind of where we are in the cycle, you hear people throwing around terms like late stage capitalism a lot. What I actually think it might be is just like classic kind of late stage centralized empires, in this case, nation states. And as anyone familiar with American history knows, we we actually started out with these independent states and this federalist structure. And the reality is it's just become more centralized over time. And now you see some of the kind of self-glorification of late ancient Egypt and the crumbling infrastructure and mass appeasement of, of late classical Rome the shedding of moral authority of the late medieval Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And obviously like you can pick worse examples from all of that period than what's happening now. But I think a lot of people feel like maybe the current system isn't working that well. And so what we're interested in is, is using these new coordination technologies, um, you know, in particular computers, the internet and blockchains as coordination and communication tools to help 
reclaim autonomy, self-governance, and decentralized cooperation. And DAOs are pretty clearly a mechanism through which you know, we can do this. And we can start out with these small localized experiments in self-governance and try to use the same model that's worked before to carve a path towards reproducible local nodes or neighborhoods that can be formed into a mesh network of a kind of federated bottom-up governance structure. Awesome. So that historical context is super valuable to both this conversation, but also for folks who are new to the DAO and, and just joining. I am curious to pick on a little piece of what you said about Rome in particular and tie that into our origin story, and then we'll sort of back in from that 10-year vision into more near-term stuff eventually. You mentioned universal basic income and or like a model of it that might have once existed in Rome. When I first joined the DAO, there was this term that was really interesting to me that I hadn't seen anywhere else, which was universal creator income. Could you explain for the listener what is universal creator income and how can Cabin help to enable that through this decentralized city model? Yeah. So that term, universal creator income, was coined by Lee Jin, who has written a lot about these ideas. And Lee and I have talked a lot about this because I think we both were interested in the way that the gig economy was evolving into the the creator economy. So I spent six years before this at Instacart building software for gig workers. And you know, when I left, was really interested in thinking about how declining transaction costs from how we were building software for gig work was going to start applying to knowledge workers mm -hmm. and to creators. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's some things about the gig economy, particularly autonomy and independence that were unlocked that were really exciting, but it also didn't go quite how we had planned or hoped it would. And so um, I think Lee and myself and some others around that time were interested in exploring what it looked like to try to create new structures to make sure that when gig style work came to creators and, and to knowledge workers, it played out a little bit differently. And I, I think part of how that story has played out really effectively is, is DAOs. But another thing that we were talking about at the time was this idea of universal creator income and ways of providing base level support to creators so that they had the time and space to do what they do best. And what that ended up looking like in the context of, of what we were doing was we had a group that came out when the cabins were, were first built that was called the Creator Co-op. It was a group that Zach and I were a part of that was you know trying to figure out what it looked like to be independent online creators together. And we realized that it's just really important to provide people the liminal time and space to be able to do work. And you don't necessarily know where that work is gonna go or, or what's gonna end up happening to it when it's at that early nascent stage. And so the sort of proto version of the DAO came out of this idea. We were sitting around um, a campfire late one night and we started talking about crowdfunding a creator residency so that people could have that liminal time and space without any constraints to come and have you know, a place to live and work for a month on whatever they wanted to, to work on. And so that was sort of our first foray into this idea of creating a universal creator income. Lee has continued to explore other avenues of what that could look like. And you know, I think a lot of the Web2 platforms that have now launched large funds to support early stage creators on their platforms, kind of the path that has come out of a lot of Lee's work on that. Love it. And not a question, but more just a comment on like, I, I think it was that piece that really attracted me to the DAO early on. I did Venture for America a few years ago, and Andrew Yang has lots of work that he's published on uh, the rise of automation and, and kind of a conclusion that he and others in that space draw is that we're a lot of different kinds of careers will ultimately wind up being creative. And to that end, like creating space for that safety net and freedom to work on whichever idea the creator is most fascinated by, I think is super important. So as we integrate that into the cabin concept and start to digest this idea of decentralized city, there's kind of two ways I think about our city being tied together. The first is through a shared culture. And the second is through a tech stack, both hardware and software. So I'm curious, Zach, first to, to chat a little bit about shared culture and how is it that we create that shared culture? What does it mean for us to be a community DAO as opposed to a social DAO or an investment DAO? 
Yeah, for sure. As a community DAO, our primary focus is the community, or, or you could even say our primary product is the community that we're all operating a part of. In the same sense that a co-op really is operating as themselves. That's like what they primarily what they do. They're not trying to like produce some out, output. Mm-hmm. You know, an investment DAO is a group of people who have pooled some capital together and they're trying to earn a return. Um, what we're really trying to do is just have a community, make it a strong community, but grow grow that community while mm-hmm. keeping the things that make that community Mm -hmm. unique uh, the same. We think about this a lot when we're doing onboarding, right? Like how do we signal to people in a way that isn't exclusive, but is more of a signaling mechanism, right? Like what the culture is and then come to a a mutual decision whether or not it's a culture that they're going to want to be a part of. John, anything to add to the shared culture community piece? Yeah, when you you look at all of the best cities in the world, the places where people want to move to and live. Some of them are in great places or ha- have other you know, things about the geography that, that is exciting or appealing. But what people are generally moving for is the people and the culture. And there's a great Paul Graham essay mm-hmm. called Cities and Their Ambitions mm-hmm. um, you know, that talks about what some of the core cultural ambitions are of different cities. And so, you know, if you're in New York City, maybe it's about money and finance maybe in la it's about fame in dc it's it's about political power and i think what we're excited about is making a decentralized city where the core values and the core culture is about independent online creators it's Mm -hmm. about people who want to have this kind of lifestyle and and work independently online and meet and spend time with other people doing the same thing i think that the important part about cities is is that sort of connection between people. And so this is what makes a a decentralized city possible is that shared governance and culture, even if we're not all in the same location. Maybe the, like the other term that you'll hear for this that gets thrown out in web three is the vibe, right? Mm -hmm. Like the vibe of a DAO. Mm -hmm. It is a funny term, but I think there is an emerging technical definition of it within the concept of marketing within the field or idea of marketing. Whereas now that we have crypto and all these Web3 tools, we've reduced the transaction cost for coordination. And when the transaction costs go down, what's what you're capable of as a group goes up. And whereas in a traditional organization, you have a brand, Mm -hmm. right? And kind of the most that you can manage along this vector is, is a brand. When your transaction costs go down, you can manage for more, you can accomplish more. And so that's where you end up with this idea of a buy where it's like potentially a culmination of multiple brands, or that's like almost a very transactional commercial way of looking at it. But when we think about our our community or if we think about our vibe, it's like so much more than like the image or the visuals of it. A lot of it is the, the sounds or the dress or the place. I think place being a particularly important one, right? Big part of our culture is being outside of traditional cities, not just because what we're building is different, but because that's part of our vibe is being in the woods. <laughs> and that's where else are you going to find like better liminal time and space than out in nature? Right? I'm glad you said that. I, I do want to transition into that physical building for a moment. So we talked about the shared culture. What is the tech stack that informs this decentralized city? So both the hardware that exists here on what we're calling node zero outside of Austin, Texas, and what is also the software that enables us to connect between nodes. And John, maybe you want to start on the property that we're on right now? Sure. When we think about the hardware stack, we're really thinking about three things, the land, the infrastructure, and the buildings. And I think our hope is that over time, we'll start to see a lot of different configurations, uh, a lot of diversity, you know, of different locations and different physical structures that make up the network. But for, you know, Node Zero, what we focused on was trying to find land in a sweet spot between being close enough to a city where you have access to dense culture and better infrastructure and airports and that sort of thing, but also far enough out that we had less regulation and more nature. And then, you know, for infrastructure, we tried to go as off the grid as possible, which includes our own 70 foot internet tower and solar panels and well and septic system, et cetera. Um, and then for the buildings, we, we did prefabricated building structures. In, in the case of our first build, it was made out of shipping containers and that, that's a pretty interesting hardware stack for creating a structure where you can then either purchase collectively or 
you know, have land anywhere in the world and then start to have stuff that you can, you know, have a pretty easy playbook for putting off-grid infrastructure and physical housing on top of that. And that forms the, the hardware stack. And then on the software side, you have kind of a combination of the social layer that is facilitated by the internet. In our case, a lot of that happens on Twitter and Discord. And then you have the financial and governance layers that are facilitated by Cabin, our native token. There's a fun story from early Texas history where there was this innkeeper named Angelina Eberly who there's a statue of her just outside of the Texas Capitol because in the brief period where Texas was its own country, Sam Houston, the president of Texas, showed up in Austin and tried to literally steal all the records from the Capitol and move them to his namesake town of Houston. And this innkeeper had to like keep him off with a cannon, <laughs> like was firing a cannon at like the president of the country so he wouldn't steal the capital. And this is the sort of thing that blockchains help solve <laughs> is, you know, you don't need to have all of your physical records and your, um, you know, governance and all these things happening in one place. You can have a decentralized public ledger mm -hmm. where you can store records and where you can do governance. Mm -hmm. And that really makes it a lot easier to, to start creating decentralized cities. You mentioned this desire to have a diversified way in which some of these nodes get built. As you reflect on the build last year at the containers, what do you think went really well from this piece? And then if you were to do it differently, what is there something you would change or advise others on how they build out their own nodes? Yeah, I'm probably biased um, against shipping containers by having built with them. <laughs> Turns out all construction is just harder than you know you you would expect, and so anything that you've built with, you you probably have like a slight bias against. I think that prefabricated structures make a lot of sense for, for the reason I was mentioning, right? It's really nice to have something like shipping containers where you can then put them on an 18 wheeler and, and move them around to different locations, have an easier way of moving things to a new node if you wanted to, or having a repeatable playbook for helping people launch nodes. But I think I've really come around to the perspective of Jane Jacobs here about city building, which is that you want a real diversity of structures because that's how you get really interesting cities. If you look at a lot of the most interesting neighborhoods in, in big cities, you know, they aren't monolithic structures. They're a bunch of different types of structures with all kinds of different people living in them. And so I think hopefully we'll be able to expand in that way here at Node Zero. And then we can also use Node Zero as a test bed for trying out all sorts of different types of structures so that other people who want to start nodes can learn from it. And Zach also has some pretty interesting ideas around like how to think about the kind of frontier of expansion of a city in terms of types of structures that, that we're exploring. Yeah, I think there's sort of two two additional points on, on diversity from Jane Jacobs that we can draw when we're talking about DAOs. One is a very practical, unsexy, unromantic one. And then the other one is maybe a um, inspirational one. The unsexy one is that I think that if you want to build something that you want to be around in a long time, you don't start by cutting stone, right? You start by, use the example of a city because that's what we're talking about, but pitching tents, mm -hmm. right? Something that's like very movable, very composable, very, you know, reconfigurable. Mm -hmm. If you start by cutting stone, you end up in a situation that a lot of ancient or old European cities are in where the doors are five feet tall and people are much taller now. Mm -hmm. But because those doors are in houses that are built of stone, they're, they're very difficult to change mm -hmm. as, as people do. So you want to be building permanent structures for things that you know are permanent. And the way that you get there is by starting with impermanent things. So the process for us, I think, for future development starts with something like tents. Uh, we've talked about yurts. We've talked about geodesic domes. We've also just talked about simple glamping tents. And the nice thing there is we can lay them out in a week. We can have a bunch of people from the DAO come out and do a build week and pitch 10 to 20 tents and see, test the configuration. Is this going to foster the kind of community that we want, right? Mm -hmm. Where people are going to be naturally intersecting in ways that, that fosters community and such uh, based on how we've configured the tents. And we can easily change the architecture of the city or the layout of the city when it's just tents because we can just move them. Sure. And then once we've settled on a layout, then we can start to talk about 
building more permanent structures. Like, again, here we're not going to like then jump to building a castle. What you what you jump to is building something that's just like a little bit more permanent. Mm -hmm. And over the course of time, you just like ratchet up the level of permanence. Mm -hmm. And then the only things that like become truly permanent are things that you know are never going to change. Yeah. And the plan that we've talked about in one of the one of the areas that we're wanting to build up here, we'll probably build a permanent bathhouse right mm -hmm. at some point. Start with a temporary one, and then over time mm -hmm. migrate to a permanent bathhouse. But there's probably not necessarily a point where all of the homes in this neighborhood as we as we develop it will be permanent because the nice thing about these tents is we can they can always be the frontier we can always be expanding out we get this nice diversity within a single place and then we can we're actually like using that diversity for a very practical purpose when you think about diversity over time right the more inspirational reason for i think pulling from james j jacobs thoughts on on diversity and the importance of diversity in cities is in a lot of ways, DAOs are like an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And if you look at natural ecosystems, diversity plays two important roles, one of which is resilience and the other of which is stability. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you want to build a stable DAO, you want to also build a diverse one. Stability is sort of the resistance to deviating from the mean, whereas resilience is the rate at which you return to that mean whenever there is a whenever there is a uh, divergence, right? And then diverse ecosystems, diverse natural ecosystems, they're much more stable and then they're much more resilient across both those vectors. Awesome. I have one last follow-up from what you said, John, and then I'm, we're going to transition more away from the the, the hardware stack into the how we're organized via a software stack. This is actually a software question, but I, I think will give us a nice segue, which is you mentioned this cabin token that we use. As if I am a, a child, a five-year-old who understands nothing about the space, which is pretty accurate, could you please tell us what exactly the function of the cabin token is? Sure. So I think the place to start here is just to think about the, the origin of the token, which was this crowdfund for the creator residencies that we mm -hmm. talked about. So what happened was people donated money, and in exchange for that money, they got the ability to vote on who got to come out here for the residencies. Mm -hmm. And the way we did that was via this token. It turns out that having a way for people to own a thing that represents their ability to vote is a very good use for, for blockchains and for tokenization. And so that was where we started. And what then ended up happening is a bunch more people showed up and they wanted to contribute to this vision of building a decentralized city. And so we started voting on other things mm -hmm. that weren't, you know, just the creator residency mm -hmm. program. We started allocating budget for projects and, you know, giving people money to start new guilds and to work on media and products and things that would help contribute to this vision. And at that point, I think you, you could really start to call what we're doing a DAO. Mm -hmm. So great segue because you mentioned this word guilds and Zach, you are our leader slash facilitator of the guilds. That's right. So can you speak a little bit about what is a guild and how does it relate to how we organize and get work done as a DAO? Yeah, I think we use the term guilds. A lot of other DAOs are using the term sub DAO. We like the word guild in part just because it's better lore for what it is that we're trying to do. And then two, there's, I don't believe there's ever going to be a time where we'll have more than one token in the way that I think is implied by, um, by sub DAOs. But effectively, it's a sub organization or a sub unit of work. We got to guilds just like John was describing, through this sort of like process of developing more permanent structures within within the DAO. It all started off as five or six channels in a Discord server. And mm -hmm. as kind of needs emerged, uh, as what we were trying to accomplish changed and grew, new things started to pop up, new ways of coordinating within our, within our DAO arose. And then kind of natural groupings uh, formed, right? Just like you would expect in a natural ecosystem. So an example, I'm currently leading the product field Guilds. Product Guild started off as a channel for some of the designers and artists in our DAO to coordinate on doing designs for header images for blog posts mm -hmm. that we were mm -hmm. publishing or designing the first iteration uh, of our passports, uh, which we sold for season two. Right? Mm -hmm. And just like a place for them to coordinate. And then as that sort of like group of activity or, or area of activity, area of contribution grew, it made sense to kind of put a boundary around it in the same way that a lot of cities 
put a wall around what their boundary is, right? Put a boundary around it as a way of defining it and what that activity is. So sure. we've got a couple of guilds. Product Guild is one. The Placemaking Guild is focused on actually managing this place mm -hmm. and the sense of place throughout the DAO. So they run all of our retreats. They also run our ambassador program, run our build weeks. We've got our media guilds, which evolved out of changing the mirror publication that we have. Mm -hmm. And again, that one started as just a single channel for writers to chat about what they wanted to write about and then mm -hmm. grew into now we've got multiple teams working on multiple articles at a given time. We've got a podcast that's coming out soon, <laughs> as you as you all know. Um, and we've got a newsletter that comes out every week, right? And the Media Guild manages that in their own way. We've also recently launched a Community Guild, which Jackson, you know a lot about. But again, that was kind of like community was something that was happening across the DAO, and, and there were specific places that needed to be carved out to discuss that and to coordinate on that. And then as those coordination needs grew, so did the space that was allocated to them. Appreciate that answer. I appreciate you designating those four different guilds that we have to date and there could always be more. Yeah. I'm curious to learn a little bit more about why your title is facilitator or leader of the guilds and why you're not our, our CTO or our COO and why, why John is our caretaker rather than a, a CEO. Can you answer that in the context of being a, a DAO? Yeah, I think this is one of the ways in which DAOs are unique. And John, who has a lot more exposure to traditional CEOs or, or people who are working in the sort of the traditional Web2 tech world, has a lot of stories that I'll hope, I hope he shares about kind of explaining how we operate. But yeah, you know, John's not the CEO. I am not the CTO. We don't have a CEO. There's no, there's no chief level of the DAO, right? And there's no, and, and I think the important point there is uh, there's no centralized coordinator, <laughs> centralized person who's making decisions. What I do is facilitate. So it was not my idea, for instance, that we should have a community guild or a placemaker guild or that we should have a writer's guild. Right? More of these ideas emerged from the DAO. And what I did is jumped in to sort of facilitate them becoming a thing. But those are all led by other people. And there's a world where I'm not in this role. There's a world where my role is I maybe go back to being a more like an individual contributor style role or, uh, you know, who knows? That's one of the really cool things about DAOs. So Zach kind of implies this liquid nature to one's contribution to the DAO that like currently he's what we call a core contributor. But that if he so chose, or if the DAO so chose, that his level of commitment could be scaled up or scaled down. And so could you talk a little bit about the different concentric circles where the outermost circle might be a token holder or an audience member, and the, the innermost circle is like a core contributor like the two of you? What are those different concentric circles? And what is, in that context, a bounty hunter? Why is it called a bounty hunter? And why are we a bounty first organization? Wow, great questions and a lot to unpack there. So first off, I'll start with this whole idea of sort of the concentric circle model, which is definitely the dominant idea of a sort of mental model we all use for how DAOs are structured. I hope somebody will come up with a better mental model here. Mm -hmm. I certainly haven't. I saw Scott Moore from Gitcoin tweeted recently a bunch of pictures of the sort of Earth-centric model of astronomy and compared that to this concentric circle model of, of DAOs that we use. And I hope we can figure out something better. But in the meantime, it, it's a pretty good way of conceptualizing it. Really, what it means is just that DAOs are highly permeable organizations. And I think one of the you know, pe people talk a lot about decentralization as, as a core tenant of DAOs, it of course is, but another key tenant is the openness and accessibility of DAOs. And what that means is that anybody can come in and you know hop in our Discord server, join the community, earn or buy the token, get involved, and ultimately manifest their role. I think this is one of the really strong cultural values and norms we've developed is this idea of manifesting your own role. But like Zach said, he's manifested his role as facilitator of the guilds. I've manifested a role as caretaker. These were things that are titles we came up with for ourselves that were then voted on and approved by the DAO. Anybody can sort of manifest the role that makes sense for them and makes sense for what the DAO needs by coming in and jumping in and getting involved. And 
ultimately the way to do that as a new person coming in is through bounties. So if you think about the kind of types of work that we offer, the easiest way to get involved is the kind of classic gig work that we were talking about earlier. And the format for that is typically a bounty, a well-structured piece of work that we know needs to be done and that we think are, is kind of an atomic unit that somebody coming in could pick up and run with. Mm-hmm. And that's really how you demonstrate proof of work within a DAO. And that proof of work by completing bounties, you know, then shows people that you are highly trustable and that you can get things done and be an effective contributor. And, you know, then that may be a step in the direction, if you want, of having a a bigger role within the DAO in terms of your ability to get things done and to bring together people and and get budget allocated for things that you and the DAO believe in. But the cool thing about this is it's not a linear path and and the goal should not be for everyone to be a core contributor or something like that. The goal should be for everybody to figure out how to manifest the role that's going to be the best fit for what they're looking for. I really appreciate that. I want to segue a little bit to, well, both of you in your answers mentioned how you manifested your role. And I largely did the same as well with plenty of guidance from the both of you. And that makes me think about this term we use a lot internally called emergent strategy. Up at the the cabins right now, there is a library. It contains plenty of political theory and governance texts, including lectures on complex adaptive systems. And so John, I know you have a political science background Speaking from that lens, could you explain a little bit what emergent strategy is and then connect it to this trailblazing and wayfinding mentality and method that we've used within the DAO, both physically and online? Sure. Uh, (laughs) You are great at the the big comprehensive questions, so we'll we'll see if I can tackle that one. But uh, I had the, the privilege of you know, going to a small liberal arts school for college where, where I got to study esoteric, weird corners of academia. And the one I spent the most time in and, and felt a real personal connection to was the sort of corner of political science and, and also environmental studies that talks a lot about this thing called a, a complex adaptive system and the sort of theory of, of emergence in particular, wrote my thesis on the structures by which small groups can coordinate using these sort of complex adaptive systems and agent-based models of them to overcome collective action problems. I just dropped like an insane amount of uh, technical jargon there. So I'll try to take a step back and, and say what that actually means. Basically, this is all connected to the theory of emergence and chaos, which is basically to say the process by which individual atomic units, whether that's, you know, people or animals in an ecosystem or or anything else, by completing, you know, sort of simple behaviors on their own can form these complex systems that have unpredictable emergent properties when they all do it together. So like with ants, for example? Uh, Yes, ants are a perfect example here, right? So if you think about ants, Um, They're probably the best example of an agent-based model, which is to say that each individual ant has just a couple rules that they're following. And these rules are things like, if I pick up a pheromone trail from another ant, follow that pheromone trail. If I lose the, the trail, then like wander around until I find another one. And if I end up finding food, then like follow the trail back to the ant hill and, and start over. That's pretty much all the rules ants have. And if you go, literally, I would recommend doing this sometime, just like go watch some ants walking around. And they really follow those like very simple rules. But what that allows them to do as a collective is exhibit these emergent properties where now they can do things that each individual ant would never be capable of, like moving you know, large quantities of food back to, to the anthill. And so I think that this type of system is pretty underexplored and underappreciated in the context of complex human behavior. And a lot of what DAOs seem to really be about is creating the right systemic structures that allow people to follow pretty clear, simple, predetermined rules, but in ways where they can add their own unique creativity and perspective and leadership to it and result in things that you know nobody could have predicted ahead of time. Awesome. So 
one of the things I think about a lot as one of our community builders is how to help people onboard into the DAO. And we have this great piece on our Mirror publication, which is creators.mirror.xyz, where Rafa discusses onboarding as wayfinding. So could you tie in that complex adaptive piece with emergence and, and onboarding as wayfinding? Yeah, the um, the metaphor that I use or the model that I use here is kind of like imagine going to New York City, but then trying to see and understand all of New York City all at once, right? It's just like, one, it sounds crazy. Two, if you can think about that experience, it just sounds so cacophonous and overwhelming, right? Mm-hmm. That for a lot of DAOs, that's, the, that's, what, that's what it feels like to join the DAO is you've got mm-hmm. just this exposure to not the skyline, but literally all of New York City right, mm-hmm. right in front of you. The goal of wayfinding is to narrow that down a lot, down to something that's much more manageable for individuals. And so instead of arriving at, in New York City and seeing the whole city, right, you just arrive at one corner of two streets. And, and there's some intentionality behind that. When we think about onboarding, the goal is to help somebody find whatever street corner is going to be the best fit for them or, or whatever neighborhood is going to be the best fit for them without being prescriptive. The idea here is if this is working well, we just have systems by which people can kind of follow their curiosity within the boundaries of the DAO itself, within Cabin, right? And then end up naturally at this at this place that is a really good fit for them, whether that's on a squad within one of our guilds or in one of our social clubs or, you know, wherever. So we're about 45 minutes in. As we approach close and wrap, I want to transition the conversation for the last 10 to 15 minutes to this current season. So for our listeners, we use seasons as sort of an analog or a metaphor for how traditional companies might refer to something as quarters to divide up our year and tackle specific projects at a time. And we have this long-term goal to build this decentralized city, but how does that happen in the near term? We've mentioned several products, plans potentially to, to build out other nodes. What is the priority for us as a coordinated unit of humans to focus on in the next few months and in this season? So we, uh, after the initial residency program, what we realized was that it was incredibly valuable to bring people from the internet together IRL. But what would maybe be even more valuable was not just to bring together strangers to meet each other for the first time, but to take people that already had shared context but don't spend time together IRL and and bring them together. And so we called that multiplayer mode. We've been exploring a couple different paths for what that looks like in season two. The first one is DAO retreats. So we realize that there are a lot of DAOs where you have people who are working together every day, but many of them have never actually met IRL. And what we believe is is probably the model of hybrid work that's going to emerge is, you know, not this like, two days in the office, three days out of the office. Some people are on Zoom, some people are IRL. That's like the worst of all worlds. Mm -hmm. What we think is much better is that say 90% of the time you can live and work anywhere in the world that you want. And the other 10% of the time you get everybody together in the same place for, you know, deep bonding, collaboration, big thinking, strategic work, you know, that, that doesn't work well over Zoom. That's the model that we're you know, building for the uh, retreat program. And then we're also running residencies, but this time, instead of having individual creators apply for the residencies, we are bringing out groups of people who have something that they share in common. And for the most part, what that looks like is actually what we're doing this week at the cabins, what Jackson is here IRL for, which is our DAO ambassador program. And so the idea there is to have you know, leaders and operators from across the DAO ecosystem come together and spend a week bonding and talking about the core issues facing their DAOs with with other people facing similar problems. I love the term DAO ambassador. We've also I've also heard us use we're we're building an embassy for DAOs. Zach, within the product guild, you're building passports. I grew up a child of the U.S. Foreign Service and. I love that metaphor. I'm curious what is so useful about it. As we, we being John and I, spent a lot of time talking about this, one of the things that we talked a lot about is what are the metaphors that we can use here to help explain and understand this. And this idea of DAOs as city-states, 
has just like a lot of lore that we can pull from that makes explaining what we're doing uh, a lot easier, mm -hmm. right? It's a lot easier to explain something new if you can peg it to something that people are familiar with. So I'm going to rattle off a few of those, those metaphorical terms and in just a short answer, explain how mm -hmm. that metaphor works for us. So passports. Passports. This is technically, it's just an NFT, but really conceptually it's your access pass to the property, to events, to anything. It's a physical card that can hold NFTs. Those NFTs you can think of as like stamps in your passport, right? Visas, et cetera. And those are what gives you access to things. So uh, next, an ambassador. An ambassador is somebody who performs a very important function of working between DAOs, mm -hmm. right? We've seen this actually kind of come about organically where people are participating in multiple DAOs based on their interests. And so when something comes up in one DAO, for instance, Cabin, somebody is able to raise their hand and say, actually, this is how Crosshouse solved this based mm -hmm. on the fact that I contribute to both. Mm -hmm. The ambassador program is a way of actually trying to foster that and solidify that as a part of the broader ecosystem. What about immigration papers? We, we want our DAO to be open and transparent and, and public. We also want to guide people as they're entering the DAO and, and kind of understand what our expectations are, how our community operates, et, et cetera, and give them a good sense of what it looks like to be a good citizen of Cabin DAO. And so our immigration process is uh, a way of, of doing that. You join an onboarding call, hear about the good context on the DAO, et cetera, first. And so, John, the last one for you, back to this idea of embassies, what is the vision for how both the embassy ties into the metaphor, but also how it can sort of sustain us for the next few years while we manifest our future and, and kind of achieve this decentralized city vision? Sure. So if you just take a step back and think about what we're talking about, what we just shared here, what we've done is we've minted a currency and we've printed passports, and we are bringing together ambassadors. And so while we would certainly not say that we are, you know, trying to be a sovereign entity or, or anything like that, I think we are LARPing as, as a city state. And, you know, th that is a, a <laughs> bit of internet culture that means live action role play. And I think speaks to the sort of goofy and irreverent, you know, but also a legitimate way in which we are starting to figure out what it looks like to build these tokenized communities that have the potential to be around for, for a really long time. And so the Embassy for DAOs is a great way for us to take a pretty clear step in that direction and start experimenting with some of these primitives like passports and, and ambassadors, while also helping us bootstrap the supply and demand of this sort of marketplace that is our decentralized city. And so you know, we, we know that there's a real need because we are a DAO <laughs> for DAOs to have these sort of spaces like like we've talked about to get together and to work on, you know, strategy and to bond with other DAOs and that sort of thing. And we think that's a really good place for us to focus energy right now. And then as the ecosystem grows, we'll be able to bring on more nodes and also bring on more programs and, and hopefully eventually not just use the passports as a way for ambassadors to come out for retreats and residencies, but also for anybody to potentially live across the cabin network. I'm glad you brought up marketplaces. And I'm going to try this out as a last question. In the Dow library, there's a copy of Andrew Chen's The Cold Start Problem, which is he's a partner at a big venture capital firm called Andreessen Horowitz. He has invested in a lot of the marketplace startups that have dominated the last decade, like Uber. And the framework that so many of those companies have relied on is, is about finding product market fit and growing both the supply and demand side. But the language I've seen a lot on Twitter around DAOs is less on product market fit and more on community product fit. And so as a concluding question, how much does that resonate with you? And as a bonus, what for listeners who are just hearing about us, who are just really getting to understand what Cabin is, what are we looking for in season two and how can they learn more? A shout out to Andrew for sending us that copy of Cold Start Problem. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And yeah, we, you know, when we think about that Cold Start Problem in the context of, you know, building a decentralized city, you can imagine that that's a really hard thing to cold start, 
right? <laughs> and everything we've been talking about, certainly crypto makes that a little bit easier. And, and some of the work we're doing around bootstrapping the two sides makes that easier. But at the end of the day, you're right that it's about the community and it's about growing a community online that can then manifest in person. And so this is something that Balaji, a new member of the DAO, has been uh, talking a lot about for a long time. You know, he calls it cloud-first city development, which is this idea to essentially uh, get together with a lot of people online and then figure out how you want to manifest that in, into real life because the transaction costs are just so much lower on the internet than in physical reality. And so I think that definitely resonates with the path that we're following. And, and I also think that the community will increasingly be the primary moat and the primary way that these Web3 organizations are differentiating themselves. Thanks so much for that, John. Zach, to bring us out, what can folks who are looking to add value do to learn more and to potentially start contributing and joining the DAO? Yeah, if this is a vibe that is appealing to you, then the call to action here is to join our Discord server, where you'll be greeted by Jackson and John Dean, and we'll take you through our immigration process, our onboarding process, and find you a place within the DAO that makes sense. The amazing thing about DAOs, and this is maybe where that product market fit, community market fit metaphor starts to break down, is DAOs are so much bigger than a single product in a single market. And so if the overall vibe is appealing to you, then I promise there's a place within the DAO where you'll fit and feel comfortable and, and find good local community within, uh, within the DAO. So please join. Well, thanks so much for joining this uh, episode today. John, thanks for hosting us in your actual home in this part of the land and I'll see you both later today, but also in the metaverse. Awesome. Thank see you, Jackson. You. Thank you.